Welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at these two Apple III computers. Now, I picked these up from fellow Apple enthusiast Britt Dodd, who got them from fellow fellow Apple enthusiast Joel McWilliams. Now, they were having some problems getting these to work. They weren't powering up or something like that. I'm not sure exactly, but they didn't have a lot of time to dig into them to try to fix them. Now, I arranged a trade with Britt uh, with a couple of my old Macs that I didn't want anymore. Got these two Apple III's, and now that they're on my bench, let's take a look and see if we can get them to work. All right, so let's take a look at the external condition of these units. As you can see, they're pretty flippin' dirty, as would be expected for machines of their age. I mean, it's really caked in here. You can tell this one got a lot of love, too, from how yellowed it is. Uh, nothing that a good scrub and retrobrite won't take care of, of course. Lots of dust and stuff in all the crevices, but that's to be expected. Now, this one, uh, unit one as I'm calling it, has a couple of broken off keys, and they're not just missing, they are completely broken off, so that's going to be fun to fix. And this one here is also mix missing a couple keys, it's missing the uh, space bar and the plus key here, and again, this is also snapped off. So, a lot of fun to be had between the two of those to try to figure that part out. Let's flip them over now and look at them on the underside. And from the underside, we can tell they're two different models. This one says it's a 128K, and it's got some extra heat sinking on it. This one says it's a 256K, and the, uh, the underplane here is definitely a different color of metal or different style. The labels are slightly different, all of that. So there's two slightly different errors or slightly different configurations of Apple III. But, uh, you know, that doesn't really bother us any. Our job is to just figure them out and see if we can make it work. So... Uh, we're going to break the rules instead of taking them apart first. I'm just going to turn them on and see what happens. All right, so let's see what happens when we turn on unit number one. Hmm. It beeps. It beeps. The drive does stuff. It lights up. We got a power light, but we don't have any video on the screen. Very interesting. Well, that's promising. Um, a video, fixing a video issue should be pretty simple. Um, so let's take a look at unit number two. Big fat nothing. So that means just a bad power supply. Uh, again, probably an easy fix. We just either need to recap the supply or replace it with a working supply, and that should get it working. So that's good. Um, next, I'm going to try taking the supply out of unit one. We're going to put it in unit two here and see if unit two actually does anything uh, before going to that, down the rabbit hole of, of the power supply, because it would help to uh, help us uh, know if there's anything else wrong with this unit. Okay, now that we got this power supply swapped out, let's turn it on and see what happens. Turns on, that's good. And we get the retry on the screen. Now let's uh, put a floppy disk in it and see if we can boot to SOS. Well, after a lot of waiting, all it's doing is sitting here moving the drive head back and forth and going ch -ch -ch -ch, and it's not really doing anything, but we saw the SOS boot screen, which means we have basic functionality going on. We may just have a dirty head or a bad disk, no big deal there, we can diagnose those things uh, later. But it looks to me, overall, we have two functionally working units, we just have to work out some of the little glitches with them. So since, uh, dry, since this unit just has a bad power supply and potentially a bad head here, but the other one, ha uh, unit one, uh, specifically has bad video, let's start digging into the bad video issue on unit one first. So here's the Apple III test setup for unit one. We've got the unit one board in its tray out and on the bench, and we got the unit one power supply here since that's the supply that's working. I also have just a spare speaker stuck here into the speaker output so that we could hear it beeping so we know that the machine is performing its power on self test. Um, up here we got the, uh, a standard NTSC style composite video monitor so I can see that that's working. And also over here on the side is a CGA monitor, a computer graphics array monitor from the IBM era. Now why do we have this here? 
The main reason is because I want to check the RGB output back here, the standard TTL RGB output that the Apple III puts out of this port here. Now CGA here is the closest thing I had to uh, an Apple III compatible RGB video output. Since this uses TTL and this uses TTL, I can feed the signal in and the colors might be a little not quite correct, but it will sync and display a signal. Now I did have to create a little adapter here and I'll put a link in the doobly-doo um, of the basically what this adapter is and where I got the schematic from to create that adapter. Uh, looking at the board now that we have it on the bench, uh, I can see that uh, it's pretty crusty. I'm going to show you a close-up of this area right here on the board. And you can see there's just some nastiness on this board. This uh, chip right here has just got corrosion and rust on it. And it all starts around what looks to be where a battery used to live on this board. Uh, looking the board up and down as well, the bottom side of the board down here is pretty clean and the top side of the board is also pretty clean. It's only right in this section and it's worse on this side. I have a feeling there's a battery, a battery pack, something in this vicinity and the board was stored or the machine was stored uh, upright in this direction and it did the whole goopy goo where it just, it just took its alkaline contents, exploded them and barfed them down the board. Um, so I think that that is the primary cause of whatever happened here. Not absolutely sure though. Now we're going to, uh, next step we're going to do is I'm going to turn this on and we're going to see what happens. Now, again, I'm going to go into why I have both of these monitors. We know NTSC video doesn't work, but I want to see if CGA or RGB video does not work. And the reason for that is, uh, it allows me to trace down, depending what is working and what is not working, trace through the circuit to find common and different parts of the circuit that might be affected. For example, if this is failing but RGB is working, that means it's only in the NTSC decoding part of the circuit, um, where the raw data is being converted to NTSC, and this part's fine. If they're both not working, that means there is something common between both sides of the circuit, both NTSC and RGB that is causing the issue and it helps me narrow things down quite a bit. So let's go ahead and just turn it on and see what happens. Yep, first thing I can tell you right now is that screen should be black. Now I am getting a little bit of video here and this is still just completely blank, but this outer border should be black. So that's telling me something's not right here. Also, what is this pattern that does not normally show up on an Apple III? And finally, right after the beep, uh, you notice we do not have the little diagnostic screen that shows up here. Um, you can't quite see it off screen, but right over here on this monitor, that doesn't show up either. So that's telling me there is something common between both RGB and, uh, and uh, composite that's causing this issue. So next, let's go ahead and look up the schematic on the internet and see if we can just deduce what is common between both sides that we can, I don't know, maybe swap out a chip and see if that's the cause of the problem. Now here's the Apple III schematic. We're going to work from the ports on the back of the computer inward towards the inside of the computer to see if we can trace commonalities here. So looking up here on this side of the schematic, we have the NTSC output and the black and white video output, which is also basically NTSC. Um, but uh, these two are our composite outputs. Um, and taking a look at this, we can see that um, we've got, you know, some, some transistory magic that turns on and off certain things and allows the video to be turned on and off, and that's all fine. We can see where the sync comes in here and the sync comes in here, and that's all great. But we can also see the RGB signals coming in here, which, you know, on the NTSC, the color output is helping to determine the color that comes out the port, in theory. Uh, but on the black and white video here is helping, is basically just being used for gray values. Great, that's fine. You know, these resistor packs are, are, are doing magic with the brightness and all of that, whatever, who cares? But that's basically is that. The most important thing here is if we look, we can see the RGB signals here and the RGB signals here. Now, if we go down to this part of the circuit, this is the actual XRGB or external RGB. These are the outputs 
uh, for good old fashioned plain TTL RGB. Um, and we can see that what's coming in here, what's shared between the, the composite outputs and what is shared between the RGB outputs are the, R, the actual RGB video data right here and sync, sync and RGB, sync and RGB. Okay, so let's go back into the circuit a little bit farther and see where these signals come from. Um, we've got these NTSC A and B signals, which are which come into only to the NTSC. That's fine. That's probably has to do with phasing and stuff. We don't care about that. But if we trace that back one more step, aha, RGB 8, 4, 2, and 1, we can see that those are tapping off of this LS399. Now, they come into this chip, but they also fly off independently themselves. Okay, so we're one step back. So maybe it's this chip. Now, I have a reason to believe that it is not this chip itself. If this chip were malfunctioning, I don't think we would be getting anything on the screen at all. See, this is an, a 74LS399, which is a multiplexer, which means depending on uh, which input is selected on the left, over here determines what output comes out on the right. If this were not functioning correctly, if this chip were fried or something like that, uh, I don't think we would be getting anything at all out this side. But because we're sometimes getting video here, um, especially when it's uh, when we're getting uh, color CGA video only, but not getting NTSC basically at all for most of the most of the time. I think it's one chip farther back from this. I could be wrong, but when we take a look at it, we'll find out. So let's go back one chip further. Well, if we go back this way, we don't have another chip. We got this, so that means this is probably uh, raw RGB, uh, raw RGB something or other. So let's take a look at this chip. So what is this doing? This is a LS157. Um, which is another multiplexer of sorts, um, or, or, you know, a, a, an input latch. Um, and this is common uh, to both sides. Uh, basically, if this were not functioning correctly, that would, I think that would be what's causing NTSC to not work at all, but RGB to work some of the time because, uh, because, we're getting data that bypasses it during some of the operation. That's just a completely random thought. Without uh, putting a scope on it and taking a look, we wouldn't know for sure. But my guess is, my gut is telling me that it's this chip. So let's take a look at that chip and see if it makes sense that it might be this. So here's that chip in question, the 74LS157. And uh, as you can see by the side of the chip here, there is just there. I don't know what this is on the side of this chip, but that chip looks insanely grumpy. Either it's overheated, it's died, or it's just corroded to all crap. So for poopies and giggles, I don't know. Let's just take this chip out. And then I want to look at the socket and see what the socket looks like. So we'll do that with my little chip lifter. Oh my gosh, that socket is green and crusty. What an absolute mess that is. I'll get you a close-up shot of that before we clean it, but first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take myself some of my contact cleaner and uh something uh, a little scrunchy or sharp or something to get in there and see if I can clean out some of that nasty in that socket. So we got my QD contact cleaner here got a little pokey tool and I'm going to spray it in there and just kind of scuff up those contacts to make them a little bit better. Okay, I don't think that's going to win any awards, but I think it will be okay. Now let's take a close-up look of this uh, chip, if I can. And I don't know what the heck happened to this thing, but it's an absolute frickin' nightmare. So what I'm going to do for poopies and giggles is I'm just going to put a new chip in there. So let me grab one. 
There we are. New chip in the socket. I'm not even going to worry about this old chip. It looks like a mess. We'll just put a new chip in. We're going to power it back up and let's see what the heck happens. Okay, now it's the moment of truth. We're going to flip the switch and see if it works correctly. Ha 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 ha! Video and video. That looks like that fixed that successfully. So I think what the next step is going to be is we're going to take this board out of the back plane and scrub it down a little bit because it's kind of nasty right in here. Okay, so the cleaning is done, and I focus mostly on this area on the cleaning. Uh, here's a quick pan shot across this, uh, so you can see that it's it's a lot better. There are some areas that are still kind of crusty, and uh, I scraped those areas with a plastic spudger, uh, and none of that gunk came off. I'm not sure if that's staining, permanent damage, I'm not sure. But the most important thing is that we got all of the alkaline crud out of there, so it can't do any more damage. Well, now we have all this put back together, let's turn it on one more time before we proceed to make sure that I didn't break anything during the cleaning process. Works like a champ, perfectly. So let's uh, go ahead and take the next step on unit one here. This is a preventative step, and I'm going to recap the power supply, basically replace all of the capacitors in this power supply. All right, so we have the power supply done now. Everything's hooked up and I have the base unit or the case here uh, on the bench so they can get the, the uh, keyboard plugged in without having to take the keyboard out. Um, and we're gonna power it up and see uh, if we need to be diagnosing anything else. What I'd like to do is get it powered up and run the, uh, the diagnostic self-test uh, from the monitor, uh, from, the, from the binary monitor, the assembly monitor, whatever you wanna call it, machine language monitor and uh, see if uh, there's problems with this RAM board that we can then diagnose and, and replace RAM chips if they're bad. But whatever, let's, let's turn it on and see what happens. Okay, all I get is retry on the screen and that's normal. Now if I hit enter, it should try to read the floppy drive. And it does nothing. So let's see if we can get into the uh, monitor and there's the monitor and so nothing is coming up on the screen the keyboard is not working now i'm going to assume the keyboard itself is fine the problem's not here the problem is on the board now i'm going to show you a couple pictures here um, from earlier where there's some obvious corrosion on this chip here and that corrosion this or this chip is the uh, keyboard controller and there's a couple other chips in this area, I think it's these two here, um, that have some rust and corrosion on them as well. Um, and I believe that that, uh, that may have something to do with our problem. So I'm going to go ahead and take these chips out and clean them up, clean up the sockets, just like we did with this chip over here. Now, with the keyboard chip, I have to be careful because this is a very special, uh, a special designed chip for the Apple, uh, Apple III. And I can't, I don't have a spare to replace that. So we got to be careful when we're cleaning that one up. All right, so we're back after cleaning that chip off. And let me tell you, that was an adventure. I spent about six hours just to get to this point. If I spent six hours, that means cleaning this chip did not fix the problem. 
So, uh, after cleaning the chip, I figured what else could it be? It could be bad traces. Now, based on the condition of the traces on the bottom of the bo board, which I'm showing right here, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the traces were bad. So what I did is I uh, printed out a copy of the schematic um, for the keyboard area there, and I traced everything coming off of the keyboard encoder chip, going to everything I thought might have anything to do with the problem. And I, tr I, uh, used my, uh, I used my multimeter to tone out every single one of these traces, and even some traces off of the, uh, uh, a couple of these address decoders. Uh, chips here just to make sure absolutely sure you know all those traces are good and all the traces came back good so not traces so then I settled on bad chips and I'm thinking how am I gonna test this bad chip here and I realized that I have another Apple 3 so I took the encoder chip out of that Apple 3 and put it in here and lo and behold the keyboard starts working but only a little bit what happened is, after putting this uh, encoder in, I was able to type, but I could only type numbers. And I was thought about that for a second. If I can only type numbers, but not letters, that means to me that the control key is probably stuck grounded. It's probably being pulled low. So either that's the keyboard or another chip. So to confirm that it was not the keyboard, I then also took the keyboard from the other Apple II and can... I'm sorry, Apple 3, and connected it to this, and I had the same problem. I could type letters, or type numbers, but not letters. So that tells me that it's not the keyboard. It definitely is a chip. So, then I printed out another schematic, and this time I drew, or I highlighted everywhere that the control key on the keyboard actually leads to. And it leads to only three chips. One is the encoder, which now I know it now is working because it works completely fine in the other machine. Uh, this uh, latch, uh, this latcher address decoder or whatever this was here, but I suspected that this one was okay because it's part of the reset circuit and I can reset the unit just fine. Now that might be a false assumption, but I skipped it because I didn't think that was the issue. And then the other one is, finally, is this, uh, this encoder here, which is a, it's like a 74LS357, it's like a 4 to, 4 to 1 address encoder multiplexer thing or something. Basically, it takes data from this chip here, multiplexes it, and splits it across these two chips so that we, you can actually send ASCII data out of the chip onto the board bus, onto the data lines here. So... I figured, okay, so maybe that's, maybe that's our problem. So I replaced that chip, and guess what? It works perfectly fine now. So now the keyboard is fully functional. Now that we have all of that figured out, the next step is to be able to type in the actual, um, type in the code for the diagnostic uh, routine that's built into this, which is F6E6G at the monitor prompt and see if we can get it to run a diag to see if we've got any other bad chips or bad RAM. Now I'm pretty much, pretty certain that we've got bad RAM on this on this uh, memory board here but let's go ahead and run that diagnostic so we can identify exactly what that bad RAM is and start swapping some of these RAM chips out. Alright now we can run the diagnostic so that's F6E6G as you can see ha ha the keyboard works. So we're going to do that and we're going to run it and see what it tells us. Okay, there's our failed RAM, but it's not saying any of the chips are bad, like the VIAs or the, uh, com the communications chips or anything like that. So that's actually good news. It's just RAM. So let's take a picture of that diagnostic, uh, the, the, the RAM failures there and map it to what the chips could be. So it looks like it's chips B4, B6, D7, and D6. So let's go ahead and mark those so I know which ones they are. So we have B4, 4B, that's this one, and B6, which is this one, and then we have D6, which would be here, and D7, which is here. Okay, well, I will see if I've got some spare chips in my collection that I can put in there, swap those out, and if it fixes the problem, then we know we've got a solution. 
Here's what I figured out for the RAM. So these two chips were pretty easy to replace. Uh, the RAM in these two banks are standard 4116 RAM chips, which are 16 kilobit chips. Um, and I don't have those. I don't have any spares of those. Uh, those are a little bit hard to come by, but I do have 64 kilobit chips. And with a little hack here, you can uh, convert those to convert the 4164 chips to work in the 4116 slots. Basically, what you're doing is you're pulling up the uh, the seventh address pin and connecting it to the voltage pin here to pull that high and then up here you snip off the 12 volt 12 volt input so that it doesn't put 12 volts onto the chip and cause bad things to happen um, that's pretty straightforward these chips however were a different story altogether so these chips are really weird little things they're called MK4332s they're basically 32 kilobit chips which don't really exist. Effectively what these chips are, are they are uh, chips that have two uh, 4116 modules on them with a couple of extra pins added so that you can uh, address the second uh, the second uh, chip on here with separate uh, row address and column address strobes. So basically, these two share these two chips on here share all the pins, with the exception that the the second chip here has its uh, its own set of column and row address strobes. Um, finding these chips is near impossible. You can get them, but they're eBay specials, and you know whatever. But I had these 4116s. So what I did is I I modified the 4116. You can still see, you can see I have the same uh, the same shunt there for the address line seven to the voltage line, and then I piggybacked two of them on top of each other and connected all the pins together, with the exception of the top one. The top chip I snipped its row and column address lines or address pins off completely, then shunted them over here to the two inputs for those second set of row and address, uh, or row and column address lines that would normally go to the second chip. Here, basically, I emulated the function of one of these chips with one of these using what's called the dead bug style of, of trickery. And it worked! The machine has no more RAM problems. Here's a close-up of what the modded uh, chip setup looks like. We got the 12 volt lines cut off. We got the separate RAS lines uh, run over. We've got our uh, our seventh um, address line tapped across. Go to the other side. That's tapped across here to the 5 volt line. We got our CAS line here. Uh, this white line here uh, connected separately, and the rest of the uh, the rest of the lines are all. Uh, basically just soldered directly together. And that's again effectively gives us one of those 4332 chips uh, without having to source some wacky thing from eBay that, you know, probably isn't in a good chip. So let's uh, run the quick diagnostic so you can see that it that actually passes a test instead of just taking my word for it. All right, so let's turn it on and see what happens. Ha ha! passes the diagnostic test. That is awesome. So I think the next step is to hook up the floppy drive, put a disk in it, and see if it boots up. So let's do that now. Let's test the Apple III dealer diagnostics disk. Let's see what this does. It's trying to load. It's making noise. It's doing a whole bunch of nothing. So I think the drive has a problem. We either got a dirty head or the drive is slow or something like that. But let's, well, since we've had so many problems with the uh, main board on this, let's go ahead and test the main board out by cobbling together a solution to connect a disk two drive to this machine to see at the very least it'll boot from floppy in general. Okay, so here is the cobbled together solution. Uh, effectively, I'm just using some ribbon cables that are female on this end, male on that end, um, just some uh, jumper wires basically, uh, to convert this so I can plug in the 20-pin connector uh, onto the 26-pin 
uh, Apple III connector because the far left 20 pins are the exact same pinout as a standard disk two drive. These other pins have to do with special Apple III functions that we're not worried about. So that's cobbled together. Let's boot it up and see what happens with this drive. That sounds like that's working. That is working. Awesome. That is a successful test. That's telling us that the basic machine functionality is fine and reading disks is fine. The built-in disk controller magic back here is good. So that means this drive here got issues. So we will dig into that now. First things first, we're gonna clean the drive head. Now, we'll, uh, since we have uh, alcohol in there, we're going to let that dry before we put a disc in. All right, dealer diagnostics, we'll try that again. Okay, looks like it is not a drive head problem. So, it's probably some sort of electronic or motor issue going on in here. So let's dig into this and uh, see if it is a motor speed issue. So we have the 60 hertz strobe and I'm watching it on the oscilloscope. So let's turn it on and uh, get an idea of how closely in tune this drive setup is. Now you won't necessarily be able to see the synchronization because of the frame rate on the camera here, uh, but I'll be able to see it and I'll give you a play by play. To me, that looks very, very slow. I would say that it is slow quite a bit. So I'm going to turn the speed down on this until it comes into sync and then we'll take a look on the oscilloscope and see where it is. Uh, we're starting to drop into sync there. Getting pretty close now. That's very close to on and it's showing a speed of approximately 40 hertz. That means it is 20%, not 20%, 50% slower than it should be. Nearly 50 or nearly 20, somewhere in there, I don't know. Me and math, we don't get along. Uh, but basically, that drive is very slow. So we're going to have to dig into that and figure out why that is. I'm going to adjust the speed pot here while adjusting the uh, strobe rate of the strobe while this is running to see if I can uh, get this to speed up any, um, see if I can get it up to its normal speed. Well, it looks like the maximum speed I can get this up to is about uh, 45. Um, uh, on the strobe scale here, and we need to get it up to 60 to get it up to speed. So I'm thinking we've got a bad capacitor uh, on the motor driver or something like that, or possibly even, maybe more likely, the uh, spindle needs to be uh, lubricated or something like that. So we'll take a look at that now.
You may be able to tell by the D-speed test here that I really didn't uh, trust the strobe light test function that I had set up. So I used the uh, standard diagnostic procedure as, uh, as stated in the Apple III uh, technician's documentation or whatever you want to call that. And um, yeah, I was able to adjust the pot and get the speed of that uh, set pretty close. It's a hair fast, but it's pretty close. Now, uh, I did some further testing uh, off camera, and it seems that this Apple III disk drive simply does not like uh, disks written by other drives. If I use ADT, or I should say ADT Pro, with the serial cable and write a disk image to it, it writes the disk image just fine. And we're going to step forward to something else. And that thing is the power supply. Even though I recapped it, it is injecting a lot of noise onto the power rails of the machine. I tried several times to record that. You can hear it coming through the speaker uh, pretty, uh, pretty loudly, but it doesn't really record well. Uh, another thing, too, is if you stick your ear right next to the, uh, the transformer here, you can hear a lot of hiss in the transformer as well. So we're just going to go ahead and swap the whole supply out with a Reactive Micro Universal Power Supply. You can't tell, but I can. That sounds a lot better. Now, I've built one of these before into an Apple II, so I have a video I'll put in the card up at the top corner there so you can uh, check that out and see what it's like to install one of these. I'm going to wrap this up for today. I still have several things to handle with this machine, notably the keyboard controller chip, broken keys, missing feet, and a full cleanup. I might even do a retro bright on it, but I'm not sure about that yet. Before I do all of that, though, I want to take on Unit 2, so I'll tackle that in the next video. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on my latest adventures. You can also support me through Patreon or by snagging some merch. Links in the description. Well, that's all for today's episode. While you're here, check out some of my other videos, and remember, 8 bits are all you need.